I have hunted butterflies in various climes and disguises, as a pretty boy in knickerbockers and sailor cap, as a lanky cosmopolitan expatriate in flannel bags and beret, as a fat, hatless old man in shorts. I discovered in nature the non-utilitarian delights that I sought in art. Both were a form of magic. Both were a game of intricate enchantment and deception. Leaving Bryceland, loquacious low was silent. Cold spiders of panic crawled down my back. This was an orphan. This was a lone child, an absolute waif, with whom a heavy-limbed, foul-smelling adult had had strenuous intercourse three times that very morning. And whether or not the realization of a lifelong dream had surpassed all expectation, it had, in a sense, overshot its mark and plunged into a nightmare. I had been careless, stupid, and ignoble. And let me be quite frank, somewhere at the bottom of that dark turmoil, I felt the writhing of desire again. So monstrous was my appetite for that miserable nymphette. Mingled with the pangs of guilt was the agonizing thought that her mood might prevent me from making love to her again, as soon as I found a nice country road where to park in peace. In other words, poor Humbert Humbert was dreadfully unhappy. And while steadily and inanely driving toward Leppingville, he kept racking his brains for some quip under the bright wing of which he might dare turn to his seatmate. It was she, however, who broke the silence. Oh, a squashed squirrel, she said. What a shame. Vladimir Vladimirovich Nabokov, scholar, lepidopterist, and one of the great novelists of the 20th century. Born April 23, 1899, at St. Petersburg, into a family of cosmopolitan aristocrats. At an early age, Nabokov learned English and French, becoming, in his own words, a perfectly normal, trilingual child. With the Bolshevik Revolution, the Nabokovs left Russia Vladimir found himself in exile, first at Trinity College, Cambridge, and later in Berlin and Paris. Between 1922 and 1940, Nabokov published nine novels in Russian for the emigre community. In 1940, and by now married to Vera, with a young son, Dmitri, Nabokov moved on once again, this time to America, where he became curator of Lepidoptera at Harvard and professor of literature at Cornell. In 1961, with the huge success of his masterpiece, Lolita, Nabokov moved into the Palace Hotel Montreux, where he lived and wrote until his death in 1977. Of course, uh, incredible as it uh, may seem, perhaps not everybody remembers the way Lolita starts in English. So perhaps I should do the first lines in English. First, Lolita, light of my life, fire of my loins, my sin, my soul, a lolita, the tip of the tongue taking a trip of three steps down the palate to tap at three on the teeth, lolita. I understood it was a moment of grace for me to, uh, to be handed this manuscript and to have a chance to publish it. All I knew was that it had been turned down by uh, four or five American publishers who uh, had published uh, things by Nabokov at various times. So they knew him, they knew how, uh, how responsible, how involved a, uh, a writer he was. And their reaction to Lolita was, was absolutely stupid, but it reflected the attitude of publishers and of the public in general uh, in those days. But I had already published the first books in English by Samuel Beckett, the translations of Jean Genet, and a few other real writers. 
And that's the reason why I was sent the manuscript of Lolita, in fact, because Nabokov felt that he had found the only publisher in the world able to understand his book and, and to publish it, which I did. You see. Lolita would be read and discussed at cabinet level before it was finally published in Britain in 1959. It sold out on the first day. Nymphette, a nymph-like or sexually attractive young girl. 1955, V. Nabokov, Lolita. Between the age limits of nine and 14, there occur maidens who to certain bewitched travelers, twice or many times older than they, reveal their true nature, which is not human, but nymphic, that is, demoniac. And these chosen creatures I propose to designate as nymphets. Between those age limits, are all girl children nymphets? Of course not. Otherwise, we who are in the know, we lone voyagers, we nymphalettes, would have long gone insane. You have to be an artist and a madman, a creature of infinite melancholy, with a bubble of hot poison in your loins and a super voluptuous flame permanently aglow in your subtle spine. Oh, how you have to cringe and hide, in order to discern at once by ineffable signs the slightly feline outline of a cheekbone, the slenderness of a downy limb, and other indices which despair and shame and tears of tenderness forbid me to tabulate. The little deadly demon among the wholesome children. She stands unrecognized by them and unconscious herself of her fantastic power. Humbert Humbert, born in Paris, now aged 37. Scholar, writer, and nymphalept. Chance takes Humbert to the United States, where he rents a room in the house of American widow Charlotte Hayes. Humbert marries Charlotte with the hope of gaining access to her daughter, 12-year-old Dolores, Dolly, Lola, Lo, Lolita. When Charlotte is killed in an auto accident, Humbert takes Lolita on an extended tour of the United States and ever deeper into his own dark world. Humbert loses Lolita to another nymphalept, the shadowy playwright Claire Quilty. After a three-year search, Humbert finds Lolita again, now 17 years old, discarded by Quilty, pregnant, and married to a young mechanic, Dick Schiller. While Humbert awaits trial for the revenge murder of Quilty, he writes his confession. A disquietingly somber exposure of a pervert's mind. Massive, unflagging, moral, exquisitely shaped, enormously vital, enormously funny. Mr. Nabokov must be credited with knowing exactly what he is doing. However, the fact remains that Lolita is not a book to be proud of. I don't think that, a, that an artist should bother about his audience. His yeah. best audience is the person he sees uh, in, his, in his shaving mirror, of course, every morning. That, that is his best audience. Uh, but, uh, and I think that uh, the audience that an artist imagines when he imagines that kind of thing is a, a room uh, filled with uh, people wearing his own mask. Yes. Uh, you know, just uh, holding the mask of, mask of Mr. Nabokov before their faces. Well, th th that kind of thing. I mean, I've taught literature at Columbia and at Yale and different places where I I've tried to teach courses, let's say, in the, the contemporary novel written in different languages in different countries since World War II, where you'd read maybe 10 or 12 of the great novels, like The Tendrum and The Hundred Years of Solitude and so on. And for me, and I think for most of the students, Lolita always comes out as their favorite. Perhaps the first time I read it was as a hot book, you know, that um, you'd go out in the way you went at Lady Chatterley and you'd be told which page to read. But then I, when I first read it as a, you know, conscious adult, um, I was scandalized but delighted by, by the voice. Um, you know, here is a man doing a terrible thing and knowing he's doing a terrible thing, but with, with hilarity, um, with constant irony about his own wickedness. And 
even I think that early reading, overwhelmed by the sadness at the end of the book, um, when all the moral bills are called in and, and Humbert has to take on board what he's done. Well, I first met Lolita, I think, even before I became an undergraduate. And I was very, very excited by it. And I think it was, I was excited by the language. I don't know if I put it to myself exactly in this way when I was a teenager, but what I felt and what I've felt ever since is here is somebody who with language has done something perfectly. He did what he wanted to do and the language carries everything he wanted to say and is a perfect shape. And the other thing I felt about it was I got sort of sensuously drunk on it. I felt here is something brilliantly coloured. No wonder then that my adult life during the European period of my existence proved monstrously twofold. Overtly, I had so-called normal relationships with a number of terrestrial women having pumpkins or pears for breasts. Inly, I was consumed by a hell furnace of localized lust for every passing nymphette whom as a law-abiding poltroon I never dared approach. The human females I was allowed to wield were but palliative agents. I am ready to believe that the sensations I derived from natural fornication were much the same as those known to normal big males consorting with their normal big mates in that routine rhythm which shakes the world. The trouble was that those gentlemen had not, and I had, caught glimpses of an incomparably more poignant bliss. The dimmest of my pollutive dreams was a thousand times more dazzling than all the adultery the most virile writer of genius or the most talented impotent might imagine. The great Russians like Nabokov, Balanchine, and Stravinsky, that those three all have something in common, and that is that they had a notion of art as entertainment. That is, that it, it should be amusing. It should be there to divert you and please you. Not in some vulgar sense that it appeals to the tired businessman as he's reading for two minutes before he goes to bed, but in the highest sense that if you're fully alert and fully prepared to give yourself to this work of art, that you'll come away with a strong sense of pleasure. In this course, I have tried to reveal the mechanism of those wonderful toys, literary masterpieces. I have tried to make of you good readers, who read books not for the infantile purpose of identifying oneself with the characters, and not for the adolescent purpose of learning to live, and not for the academic purpose of indulging in generalizations. I have tried to teach you to read books for the sake of their form, their visions, their art. I have tried to teach you to feel a shiver of artistic satisfaction, to share not the emotions of the people in the book, but the emotions of its author, the joys and difficulties of creation. Every summer, my wife and I go butterfly hunting. The specimens are deposited at scientific institutions, such as the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard or the Cornell University Collection. The locality labels pinned under these butterflies will be a boon to some 21st century scholar with a taste for recondite biography. It was at such of our headquarters as Telluride, Colorado, Afton, Wyoming, Portal, Arizona, and Ashland, Oregon, that Lolita was energetically resumed in the evenings or on cloudy days. Few things indeed have I known in the way of emotion or appetite, ambition or achievement that could surpass in richness and strength the excitement of entomological exploration. Here's another arabia. Good, beautiful. All right, now let's take care of the island spot. That's the real rare one. Oh, isn't he beautiful? Let me look at my demon objectively. With the exception of my parents, no one really understood my obsession. And it was many years before I met a fellow sufferer. And he would come back from uh, a summer's collecting trip in New Hampshire, where one of the rarest of all butterflies of the East uh, can be seen, but most of the veteran collectors won't see one in their lifetime. 
he saw a Strymon Ontario, the white W hair streak butterfly. And when he got back into town, there was no one else to talk to about it that would have been as thrilled as I was. So he immediately told me about it. And this was the kind of, of joy we had. The few of us who were very close to him in conversation and so on, I don't think had the slightest inkling of what he was working on in fiction. Uh, but there he was writing Lolita that, that uh, captivated such a vast audience soon after. I had no idea it was coming. And in fact, he seemed to me to be a rather dignified gentleman. And so when I began to read Lolita, as soon as it came out, I was astounded at the earthiness of the writer who, whom I knew and who was writing these things that were in Lolita. I want my learned readers to participate in the scene I am about to replay. I want them to examine its every detail and see for themselves how careful, how chaste the whole wine suite event is, if viewed with what my lawyer has called in a private talk we've had, impartial sympathy. So let us get started. I have a difficult job before me. Main character, Humbert the Hummer. Time, Sunday morning in June. Place, sunlit living room. The magazine escaped to the floor like a flustered fowl. She twisted herself free, recoiled, and lay back in the right-hand corner of the Davenport. Then, with perfect simplicity, the impudent child extended her legs across my lap. By this time, I was in a state of excitement bordering on insanity. But I also had the cunning of the insane. Sitting there, on the sofa, I managed to attune by a series of stealthy movements my masked lust to her guileless limbs. It was no easy matter to divert the little maiden's attention while I performed the obscure adjustments necessary for the success of the trick. Talking fast, lagging behind my own breath, catching up with it, mimicking a sudden toothache to explain the breaks in my patter, and all the while keeping a maniac's inner eye on my distant golden goal, I cautiously increased the magic friction that was doing away in an illusional, if not factual, sense with the physically irremovable but psychologically verifiable texture of the material divide, pyjamas and robe, between the weight of two sunburnt legs resting athwart my lap, and the hidden tumour of an unspeakable passion. In the scene on the Davenport, he tempts her to move nearer to him. She has her naked legs under her short skirt, sort of carelessly flung about, and he tempts her to move nearer to him by singing the silly song about Carmen and the barman. And he talks and talks to her and gets her to sort of throw her legs over his lap and manages to produce an orgasm in himself of which he claims that she was totally unaware, thus, as it were, producing for himself total self-satisfaction without in any way impairing her innocence, which at this stage of the novel he feels is an immense moral and, of course, um, sexual achievement. I think in the writing of it, Nabokov leaves it open to the reader to wonder how much Lolita was conscious of the excitement that is caused in Humbert. Humbert never asks because it's very important to him to suppose that she is totally innocent. But any little girl, or anybody who ever was a little girl reading that, will know that many little girls are perfectly well aware of causing some sort of excitement which they rather enjoy stirring up. Um, though they wouldn't, of course, enjoy it any longer if somebody made a grab for them. It's. Um, it's a dangerous scene. I think it's the one almost everybody remembers when they first think of that novel. They think, oh yes, the scene on the Davenport. I even remembered it when I was writing a novel of my own where a man takes a girl on his knee and sort of put in an ironic reference to this happened although Lolita was not yet written. It's. Um, It isn't pornography, it is, um, it does cause you to imagine Humbert's excitement. It causes a woman to be able to imagine male self-excitement or male capacity to reach a climax simply by a mixture of sensual stimulation and visual stimulation without intercourse. and. 
I remember I, I, was a, I was not very much more than a girl when I read this myself. I remember being disturbed by it. And, and again, thinking how very well written it was. I mean, that he had actually managed to get it. I felt proud of myself. I had stolen the honey of a spasm without impairing the models of a minor. Absolutely no harm done. The conjurer had poured milk, molasses, foaming champagne into a young lady's purse, and lo, the purse was intact. Thus had I delicately constructed my ignoble, ardent, sinful dream. And still, Lolita was safe, and I was safe. The child knew nothing. I had done nothing to her. And nothing prevented me from repeating a performance that affected her as little as if she were a photographic image rippling upon a screen, and I, a humble hunchback, abusing myself in the dark. Whether the publishers found it pornographic or not did not interest me. Their refusal to buy the book was based not on my treatment of the theme, but on the theme itself. Some of the reactions were very amusing. One reader suggested that his firm might consider publication if I turned my Lolita into a 12-year-old lad and had him seduced by Humbert, a farmer in a barn amidst gaunt and arid surroundings. All this set forth in short, strong, realistic sentences. Quote, he acts crazy, we all act crazy, I guess. I guess God acts crazy, and so on. Publisher Y, on the other hand, regretted there were no good people in the book. Publisher Z said if he printed Lolita, he and I would go to jail. Did you, in fact, have any doubts whether Lolita ought to be published, considering what the subject matter is? Uh, no, no. After all, uh, when you write a book, you generally imagine uh, and envisage uh, its uh, publication in some far future. Uh, but I, I was pleased that the book was published, uh, finally. What was the genesis of Lolita? How was she born? Uh, she was born uh, a long time ago. In, uh, it must have been in uh, 39, I think, uh, in, uh, in Paris. And there was this little first throb of Lolita that went through me uh, in Paris, 39 or perhaps early in 40. Nabokov's first short exploration of the Lolita theme was written in Russian and called The Enchanter. He was not pleased with it and thought he had destroyed the typescript before leaving Europe for America. Around 1949, in Ithaca, upstate New York, the throbbing, which had never quite ceased, began to plague me again. The nymphet, now with a dash of Irish blood, was really much the same, lass, and the basic marrying her mother idea also subsisted. But otherwise, the thing was new and had grown in secret the wings and claws of a novel. A writer doesn't, in fact, choose a subject. Uh, what he does is recognize a subject uh, as his own. Um, it's not a moral act of choice, it's, a, it's an automatic subconscious choice of recognition. And when Nabokov describes Lolita, the book, coming to him as a, as a pang, as a throb, that's, that's how the books come, as pangs, as throbs. Then when you're writing it, you're constantly aware of, of the risk involved, of the, um, the degree of danger that you've opened yourself up to. Um, but you don't... You know, your, your talent, your subconscious chooses the danger, and then you just have to do the high wire act as a writer. The book developed slowly with many interruptions and asides. It had taken me some 40 years to invent Russia and Western Europe, and now I was faced by the task of inventing America. The obtaining of such local ingredients as would allow me to inject a modicum of average reality, one of the few words which mean nothing without quotes, into the brew of individual fancy, proved at 50 a much more difficult process than it had been in the Europe of my youth, when receptiveness and retention were at their automatic best. I chose American motels instead of Swiss hotels or English inns, only because I am trying to be an American writer and claim only the same rights that other American writers enjoy. And all my Russian readers know that my old worlds, Russian, British, German, French, are just as fantastic and personal as my new one is. Uh, my private tragedy 
which cannot indeed should not be anybody's concern, is that I had to abandon my natural uh, language, my natural idiom, my untrammeled, rich, infinitely rich uh, and docile Russian uh, tongue for a second-rate brand of English. Какое низкое коварство полуживого забавлять, ему подушки поправлять, печально подносить лекарства, вздыхать и думать про себя, когда же черт возьмет тебя. Теперь я? Теперь прочти мне вторую. Так думал молодой повеса, летя в пыли на почтовых, Всевышний волю из леса, наследник всех своих родных. Друзья Людмилы и Руслана, с героем моего романа, без предвесловий сей же час, позвольте познакомить вас. Онегин, добрый мой приятель, родился на брегах Невы, где, может быть, родились вы или блистали, мой читатель. Там некогда гулял и я. Но... Most of his active writing life, he lived as somebody who was uh, bedeviled by all kinds of uh, very basic problems of survival. I mean, he was someone who, when he was a boy, had everything and inherited millions of dollars when he was 16 years old from that gay uncle of his, and who then uh, lost everything when he was 19 because of the revolution, and who very gallantly, and I think with a lot of uh, aplomb and kind of a sportsman-like attitude toward life, gave his tennis lessons and his language lessons and lived in furnished rooms in, in Berlin and married a woman who was Jewish. And because of her uh, ethnic origins, they were obliged to leave Germany, which I don't think either of them liked very much anyway, came to Paris, then came to America. And I think when he came to America, he really had a few introductions, almost no reputation. And again, like Humbert, uh, he was always living in other people's houses. I mean, he was a professor who would move from town to town, live in one furnished house after another. And But I think that a lot of the aloofness that you see in Nabokov is a kind of, uh, of slightly wounded pride uh, of a man who is a great aristocrat, who's making his way, I think, quite nobly, really, through a world that has completely changed all around him and where he really possesses nothing but his arrogance and his, his self-assurance. I have toyed on and off with the idea of uh, buying a villa. I can imagine the comfortable furniture, the efficient burglar alarms, but I'm enabled to visualize an adequate stuff. Old retainers require time to get old. Yes, time. And I wonder how much of it there still is at my disposal. Brian Boyd of the University of Auckland, New Zealand, is the first scholar to be given free access to the Nabokov family archive in the Montreux Palace Hotel, after eight years' work, he is completing his critical biography of Nabokov. I think what attracts me most about Nabokov is his delight in the richness of the world at, at all sorts of levels, the, the world of natural objects, the, the world of the perceptions, the world of the emotions of thought, and yet his sense simultaneously that that is not sufficient, that he wants there to be more, and his perpetual battle to try and find more. He, he enjoyed so many experiences, but then felt the pain of not being able to relive them, as it were, that they receded into the past, they were unretainable. That that was one kind of uh, disappointment built into human life, that he tried to battle against by various artistic strategies and by certain metaphysical speculations and so on. Another was the the inescapable solitariness of the soul. He enjoyed very much the uniqueness of, of human individuality and his own individuality for that matter. Uh, he always insisted on it quite emphatically, but uh, at the same time he felt that personality was a prison and that there had to be some way, or he, he wished there could be some way of, of escaping from that prison.
there were hundreds and hundreds of people who knew Nabokov or thought they knew him, but there were really so very, very few who actually knew him. He kept a, a fair reserve. And then in the last 20 years of his life, he retreated here to, to Montreux and controlled very rigorously the conditions under which people came to visit him and interview him. Dear Mr. Mossman, I am a wretched speaker and am absolutely incapable to chat on TV without carefully composed notes. My answers must be written out on cards, and I suggest that it is quite possible to type and place the cards in such a manner that the spectator will not be aware I am reading. In the past, I have frequently used this method, am able to let my gaze wander, and am quite willing to imitate spontaneous speech by little tricks of hesitation and so forth. I'm told that Tolstoy once said, late in his life, that life was a tartine de merde, which one was obliged to eat slowly. Would you agree with him? <laughs> I've never heard that story. It's a very funny one. Uh, the old boy was sometimes rather disgusting, wasn't he? <laughs> no, my own life is fresh bread with country butter and alpine honey. Which is the worst thing men do, do you think? Stink. Cheat torture and the best things be kind be proud be fearless Nabokov's only child Dmitri trained in Milan as an opera singer. He is also a racing driver, cars and powerboats, an alpinist, skier, and the translator of many of his father's Russian novels and poems. Like his father, Dmitri prefers to give carefully prepared answers to written questions. He didn't always do it, he often did it. He believed that the precision of the artist should accompany the passion of the scientist. No, I haven't gotten it backwards. That's exactly how he put it. He wouldn't uh, put up with expressing something uh, in a second-rate manner. Uh, I feel that uh, he had a point because his style and his uh, exact means of phrasing every thought uh, was a highly important part of his art. Um, at the same time, there was one interview done for American television that was quite spontaneous, where he was not reading from a meticulously prepared text and index cards, where, from a purely television point of view, uh, he comes off very well. Here I stand. Then after, after lunch, I generally sit down here, after having uh, rearranged my disc a little. It's an awful disorder here. And... After that, I, when I feel the heaviness of the evening weighing upon me, I uh, go here on the, on, on the bed. <laughs> That's why I end up. But it's very funny that sometimes, uh, after dinner, I, I, I suddenly feel very, very fresh and full of inspiration, and I go back to, my, uh, to this lecture, I say. And so it starts all over again, like in a kind of cosmic arrangement. He told me that his um, approach to writing was somewhat like that of Schopenhauer's. To him, uh, what he was to write was in like an undeveloped film, exposed but undeveloped. All he had to do was develop it. Nabokov always saw a whole novel entire in his mind long before he started writing. He would spend sometimes up to a year in just sorting out the chapters, the individual scenes in enormously ex precise detail before he actually set pen on paper. In his early days he wrote in longhand, in ink, in exercise books, but he would cover the whole thing with so many corrections to then have to start a new draft, cover that in turn with so many corrections, then start dictating it to his wife. He never learnt to type just as he never learnt to drive. But as he worked 
in the 1940s on butterflies, he began to sort out details on index cards like these ones here, which contain masses of information about one particular group of butterflies that he was working on during the 1940s. And by the end of the decade, he was starting to compose his novels or to record information that he might then use for some of his works on these index cards. Well, these are index cards, uh, which they call in France uh, fish bristol, fish bristol. Uh, and I, I buy them at, uh, at, a, at a shop here, or 100, 200 every time. And then I use them not only to jot out notes, uh, notes and uh, things which I want to remember, but actually to, to, to write my, uh, the, the novel or story I'm composing. And uh, then I rearrange them uh, in, in a given order, because it doesn't matter really where I start. The thing is more or less in my mind. I just have to fill in the gaps. When he had the whole manuscript completed, he would go back to the beginning and start a fair copy, still on these index cards, still in pencil, rubbing out as he went. He was very proud of the fact that he used the erasers of his pencils up more quickly than the lead. We don't have the, the surviving manuscripts of Lolita or Ben Sinister, the novel immediately preceding Lolita, but I think Lolita was the first one on which he composed from start to finish on index cards. Often he would write them sitting in, the, in a car outside the motel. If the motel that, they, that he and his wife had stopped in for the night during the course of his butterfly hunts was too noisy or too drafty, he would go out to, to sit in the back of the car and prop an index card on his knee and begin where he'd left off after the previous session of composition. This passage is a description by Humbert of a mural he said he would paint in the Enchanted Hunters. And he's actually using this description as a metaphor for his sexual delight, which he's forbidden even by himself to describe. It goes, there would have been a lake there would have been an arbor in flame flower. There would have been nature studies, a tiger pursuing a bird of paradise, a choking snake sheathing whole the flayed trunk of a stoat. There would have been a sultan, his face expressing great agony, belied, as it were, by his molding caress, helping a Calipigian slave child to climb a column of onyx. There would have been those luminous globules of gonadal glow that travel up the opalescent sides of jukeboxes. There would have been all kinds of camping activities on the part of the intermediate group, canoeing, coranting, combing curls in the lakeside sun. There would have been poplars, apples, a suburban Sunday. There would have been a fire opal dissolving with a rippled ring pool, a last throb, a last dab of colour, stinging red, smarting pink, a sigh, a wincing child. I think that's absolutely marvellous because it is a very luscious metaphor, very precise for the penetration of a girl child by an overexcited male. It does it in colour, it does it in rhythm. And it gives you oriental language, it gives you American language. I love the bit about the gonadal glow going up the jukebox. It gives you Lolita's world with a, an image, as it were, of the flow of seamen round and round it. And nevertheless, at the end, as it ends in its sort of brilliant bright colours, it suddenly gives you, from outside, the pain she must have been experiencing. It's pink, it's red, it causes her to wince. I think it's an amazing piece of writing. Did Lolita, Lolita herself, have an original? As a matter of fact, I don't know little girls very well. Uh, when I think uh, about this subject, I don't think I know a single little girl. I mean, I've, I've never met little girls, really. Uh, well, I've met them socially now and then, uh, but uh, Lolita uh, is, uh, is a figment of my imagination. So 
so he had to invent a Lolita from scratch and he, he went about it with great energy. He, he took notes in buses, uh, he consulted psychiatric r reports on the, the mental health of uh, young teenage girls and, and so on, read teenage magazines, that, that sort of thing, which of course were not his usual fit. Some of Nabokov's research notes for Lolita survive on 94 faded index cards. They suggest the same passion for accuracy which he had brought to butterfly classification at Harvard and show a collector's enthusiasm for the small detail of American life and language. He invented her ordinariness, her ordinary teenageness, which is part of her attraction. He invented her pleasure in her tedious music and her socks and her little bits of makeup. And he indeed then was able to make the destruction of this ordinary naturalness into a crime. The remarkable thing is that unlike, let's say, naturalists like Zola in the 19th century, he didn't simply dump his notes into his book, but he transformed everything. Because I think what his books are are great systems of meaning in which every element refers to every other one. And there is a constant humorous and poetic intelligence playing over all of the facts and finding uh, correspondences amongst the, the most seemingly far-fetched and disparate elements. There, snugly wrapped in a white woolen scarf, lay a pocket automatic. Caliber, 32. Capacity of magazine, eight cartridges. Length, a little under one-ninth of Lolita's length. Stock, checked walnut. Finish, full blued. He'll talk about uh, the dimensions of a pistol, but when he does so, he'll make correspondence with Lolita's height. And so I think one of the things is that he oftentimes writes about, as Balzac did, about obsessed people, and from the point of view of, uh, of someone who is obsessive. And what that allows him to do from a technical point of view as a writer is th an obsessive person sees references to his obsession in everything, no matter where he looks. The oh, whole thing is technically so, so beautiful and extraordinary. I admire immensely his mastery from outside of American language, the way in which he picks up things like the jukeboxes and the language of the motel advertisements and all sorts of other things, which um, he leaves exactly as they are and yet turns into some kind of strange fantasy world. I love the sort of way he takes off with word games and I love particularly um, his use of lists of things. The sort of marvellous list, which he says is like a poem of Lolita's classmates. And I thought to myself, one of the reasons that lists are so terribly exciting is because it's like Adam in Eden, naming everything. It's the sense that language creates the world, that you can sort of, by just making a list of nouns, you make a whole world. In the gay town of Leppingville, I bought her four books of comics, a box of candy, a box of sanitary pads, two Cokes, a manicure set, a travel clock with a luminous dial, a ring with a real topaz, a tennis racket, roller skates with white high shoes, field glasses, a portable radio set, chewing gum, a transparent raincoat, sunglasses, and some more garments, swooners, shorts, all kinds of summer frocks. At the hotel, we had separate rooms. But in the middle of the night, she came sobbing into mine, and we made it up very gently. You see, she had absolutely nowhere else to go. Humbert Humbert, the middle-aged seducer. No, he's in mind with an obsession. He's in man with a mind and a man with an obsession. And I think many of my characters have all set certain uh, obsessions, different kinds of obsessions. But uh, he never existed. He did exist after he had written the book. While I was, written the, uh, while I was writing the book, 
uh, here and there in the newspapers, I would read all kinds of accounts about uh, elderly gentlemen who seduce little girls. Yes. It's a kind of uh, uh, interesting uh, coincidence, but that's about all. It's a case of life imitating art. Uh, life keeping up with art. I could switch in the course of the same day from one pole of insanity to the other. From the thought that around 1950 I would have to get rid somehow of a difficult adolescent whose magic nymphage had evaporated, to the thought that with patience and luck I might have her produce eventually a nymphette with my blood in her exquisite veins, a Lolita II, who would be eight or nine around 1960 when I would still be in La Foster Lage. I would say that Tumbert is, in his voice, very close to a certain one of the perhaps half dozen voices that Nabokov always had in his head, in a highly cynical voice, an immoral voice, um, one who was aware of morality but enjoyed flouting it, a very self-congratulatory voice, a conceited voice. You take, you know, this percentage uh, of yourself, it may be 1%, or 0.01%, and you you imagine that nothing else, the other 99% isn't there. Um, all the balances, the checks and balances of your normal personality disappear, and you foreground this one voice. And then you put it in an impossible situation and see what happens. In a way, he's, he's inverting many of the values that he holds dearest. He, for him, the innocence of childhood was very, very important. Um, a family love was very important. and. I think without his own very, very uh, strong love for his son, Dimitri, with, without being able to invert that, he wouldn't have been able to write Lolita. Why did you write Lolita? Uh, it was uh, an, uh, interesting, uh, an interesting, perhaps, uh, thing to do. I wrote, uh, why did I write a little, why, why did I write any of my books after all? For the sake of the pleasure, for the sake of the, of the difficulty. You see, I have no social purpose, no moral message. Uh, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a messenger, I have no general ideas to exploit, I'm not a general. But I like composing riddles. I like uh, finding elegant solutions uh, to, to my riddles, to those riddles that I have composed myself. In the course of my 20 years of exile, I devoted a prodigious amount of time to the composing of chess problems. A certain position is elaborated on the board, and the problem to be solved is how to mate black in a given number of moves, generally two or three. It is a beautiful, complex, and sterile art, and my only quarrel with it today is that the maniacal manipulation of carved figures or of their mental counterparts during my most ebullient and prolific years engulfed so much of the time I could have devoted to verbal adventure. When Lolita is stolen by Claire Quilty, Humbert Humbert goes in pursuit. To myself, I whispered that I still had my gun and was still a free man, free to trace the fugitive, free to destroy my brother. I have a memo here. Between July the 5th and November the 18th, when I returned to Beardsley for a few days, I registered, if not actually stayed, at 342 hotels, motels, and tourist homes. I discovered at once that he had foreseen my investigations and had planted insulting pseudonyms for my special benefit. Goodness, what a tease the poor fellow was. He challenged my scholarship. I am sufficiently proud of my knowing something to be modest about my not knowing all. And I dare say I missed some elements in that cryptogramic paper chase. I noticed that whenever he felt his enigmas were becoming too recondite, even for such a solver as I, he would lure me back with an easy one. Arsène Lupin was obvious to a Frenchman who remembered the detective stories of his youth. And one hardly had to be a Coleridgean to appreciate the trite poke of a person, Horlock, England. The silly but funny D. Orgon, Elmira, New York, was from Moliere, of course, 
And because I had quite recently tried to interest Lolita in a famous 18th century play, I welcomed as an old friend, Harry Bumper, Sheridan, Wyoming. But the most penetrating bodkin was the anagram-tailed entry in the register of Chestnut Lodge. Ted Hunter, Kane, N.H. You, you will recall and speak memory compares the composition of a novel to the composition of a particular chess problem which has a, a simple solution that the unsophisticated solver will go for straight away but the more sophisticated solver will suspect that there is a, a, a rather more complex problem at issue here and will follow all sorts of false trails and all sorts of very picturesque blind alleys before coming back to the initial easy solution. And I think that's something of what he did in Lolita too. The, the unsophisticated reader will respond with moral outrage at Humbert's treatment of Lolita. The more sophisticated reader might want to side with, with Humbert who's making special claims for himself as an artist, uh, as, as a person of such refined sensitivity that the, the moral side of his treatment of Lolita simply falls away. He, he's serving much higher standards than bourgeois respectability. And then the sophisticated reader, after realising that there's something wrong with that, has to come back to the original solution and discover something about their own rather perhaps shaky sense of morality, their, their sense that, uh, uh, that art justifies anything falls away and they realize that they have to come back to rather more, uh, more more basic standards of human morality. How sweet it was to bring that coffee to her and then deny it until she had done her morning duty. And I was such a thoughtful friend, such a passionate father, such a good pediatrician, attending to all the wants of my little auburn brunette's body. My only grudge against nature was that I could not turn my Lolita inside out and apply voracious lips to her young matrix, her unknown heart, her nacreous liver, the sea grapes of her lungs, her comely twin kidneys. I do believe that literature can excite people's senses and I don't think there is an absolute argument against censorship. I think even that because this is complex and extremely beautiful art. It might stir some people up more than pornography did. Um, I also think, in fact, that Nabokov's book is a very moral book. He does make it perfectly clear that immense damage was done by Humbert to Lolita during the course of this narrative, which would have no effect at all on anybody who wished to be sensuously stirred up by the events he describes. I think, um, I thought when I reread it that it would appear dirtier because there had been so much in the newspapers about child sexual abuse and because I think all of us have been made to imagine much more clearly the fear and terror of the abused. Lolita is a very special favourite of mine. It was uh, my most difficult book. Uh, the book that treated of a theme which was so distant, so remote from my own emotional life, that it gave me a special pleasure uh, to use my combinational talent uh, to make it real. You know, it took a lot of courage to write Lolita. And people have, have come up to Dmitry Nabokov and said, you know, unforgivably, what's it like being the son of a dirty old man, you know. There are a lot of literalists out there who will think that you can't write a novel like Lolita without, in fact, being a secret slaver after young girls. So perhaps you have to stress the purest aspect of it, that it was an intellectual challenge. To me, what it does is it recasts in modern and very extreme and even perverse terms, all the elements of the classical love story such as you have in Madame Bovary or in Anna Karenina. Nabokov, in order to perpetuate the romantic novel, cast it in these very extreme terms of uh, nymphalepsy. Three years after Lolita's disappearance, Humbert Humbert finds her again. She closed her eyes and opened her mouth, leaning back on the cushion, one felted foot on the floor. 
The wooden floor slanted. A little steel ball would have rolled into the kitchen. I knew all I wanted to know. I had no intention of torturing my darling. Somewhere beyond Bill's shack, an after-work radio had begun singing of folly and fate. And there she was, with her ruined looks and her adult rope-veined narrow hands and her goose-flesh white arms and her shallow ears and her unkempt armpits. There she was, my Lolita, hopelessly worn at 17, with that baby dreaming already in her of becoming a big shot and retiring around AD 2020. And I looked and looked at her and knew as clearly as I know I am to die that I loved her more than anything I had ever seen or imagined on earth or hoped for anywhere else. I think that passage is splendid because it gives you this cold vision of Lolita as a woman and as a woman not beautiful. And then it gives you this romantic coda of how he has continued to love her and it turns it from, it turns it from pornography into a love story and also into a kind of gentle tragedy. The following decision I make with all the legal impact and support of a signed testament. I wish this memoir to be published only when Lolita is no longer alive. Thus, neither of us is alive when the reader opens this book. But while the blood still throbs through my writing hand, you are still as much part of blessed matter as I am, and I can still talk to you from here to Alaska. Be true to your dick. Do not let other fellows touch you. Do not talk to strangers. I hope you will love your baby. I hope it will be a boy. That husband of yours, I hope, will always treat you well, because otherwise my spectre shall come at him like black smoke, like a demented giant, and pull him apart, nerve by nerve. My spectre shall come at him like black smoke, like a demented giant, and pull him apart, nerve by nerve. A great expression of love, protective love, even in the app, you know, when you're dead, in the absence of your protection. Um, and also that he has salvaged something out of it, um, out of the, you know, the mess and sin he at least has made a, a what Nabokov and many readers think is a beautiful work of art. I am thinking of aurochs and angels, the secret of durable pigments, prophetic sonnets, the refuge of art. And this is the only immortality you and I may share. My Lolita.